Unit 14, land availability. <clears throat> Finding land for urban agriculture can be quite a challenge. First of all, in some areas, vacant land might be rare. Uh, some areas such as Detroit may have a surplus of vacant land, but in other areas, there may be very little. Um, urban vacant land may well be what's called a brownfield, and we'll look at that a little later in the presentation. And land for urban agriculture might be, by necessity, multiple small sites rather than one larger site. And if sufficient land is not available, it might be necessary to use alternate growing strategies, such as container gardening, uh, vertical gardening, or indoor gardening. In this slide, we see a uh, vertical container garden. Um, such gardens have been grown for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and are as suitable for some crops as they are for decorative plants. Here we see a green wall. This one is a decorative green wall, but the same techniques can be used to grow many different crops. And uh, the crops and the decorative plants could be interspersed, making a decorative wall, decorative green wall, which at the same time uh, is able to produce food. And this slide shows a uh, self-contained indoor garden, though, in fact, the same type of setup, I think, could be used uh, outdoors, at least during the growing season. Um, here you see that this garden is grown on multiple layers. Um, it can be covered with a shade cloth uh, for summertime use outdoors. It can be covered with clear plastic uh, to use outdoors to um, allow the uh, season to start earlier, maintain warmer temperatures inside. Um, it has uh, a growing area up top for plants requiring a lot of light um, middle area could be used primarily for either low light plants or could be even part of a compost system. Um, over here you see a worm farm composting setup. And on the remaining side over here, an area with dark cloth to, uh, or plastic to create a dark and humid environment for mushroom growing. In addition, notice where it says 10 to 1 slope, uh, slope from this end towards the other end, where nutrient-rich runoff is captured in the bucket and can then be applied back to the plants. A good alternative strategy. So let's say we do find some land for urban agriculture. What do we need to do before we start growing on it? Well, soil used for growing crops should be tested. And that's true um, regardless of where it is and what you're growing. Soil is tested for nutrients, the macronutrients, primarily phosphorus and potassium, as well as micronutrients. Um, soil can be tested for nitrogen, and most test kits contain um, a, uh, a nitrogen test. However, uh, the presence of nitrogen in the soil in a form that's useful for plants is actually quite ephemeral. It's, it's not a long-lasting substance in the soil when it's in a form that plants can use it. And so nitrogen tests aren't really meaningful in the long term. Um, they can still be done. Soil is tested for structure and composition. Um, does it need amendments? Is it going to have to be broken up and have amendments and things added to create the proper structure for growing plants? Um, and that's particularly true of soil that has been um, driven over 
um, it gets compacted and is probably going to need some sort of amendments. And then finally, soil can be tested for the presence of contaminants um, in the forms of heavy metals or fuels, gasoline, oil, diesel, that sort of thing, and other chemicals. And in urban environments, um, testing for the presence of contaminants is an important thing, particularly if it's possible that the site could have been a brownfield. Again, we'll talk more about brownfields in a moment. Here we have a typical consumer soil test kit. This will test for the macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, as well as for soil pH. Typical consumer soil test kits aren't able to test for micronutrients or contaminants. Um, there are some uh, kits available that will test for lead, um, but uh, other things, uh, you usually have to send your sample to a soil test lab. Here we see a device called a penetrometer, which tests for soil structure, it tests for um, hardness or compactedness of the soil and how easy the soil will be for plants to grow through. Um, this is optional. Uh, it's you know a nice thing to know, but usually we can find out a lot of what we need to know about the soil by trying to dig in it. And uh, if it's difficult to dig through, then we probably need some soil amendments. Now, as promised, we're going to spend um, much of the rest of this unit talking about brownfields as they can be prevalent in areas where we might want to practice urban agriculture. So what is a brownfield? A brownfield is land that has previously been used for industrial purposes. That's the main part of the definition. But the term also generally implies a low level of contamination with hazardous waste or other pollutants. And such areas, if they've been identified, are often marked for remediation and redevelopment. The term isn't usually applied to areas that are heavily contaminated, such as EPA Superfund sites, um, usually lower levels of contamination. Um, <clears throat> the EPA, as well as many states, maintain lists of known brownfield sites that have been identified, and many of those have been marked for remediation and redevelopment, as mentioned. Um, However, those lists aren't all inclusive, as any site has the potential to be classified as a brownfield if it has been subject to some type of contamination. Here we see a typical brownfield site. Whatever this structure is in the background, could have been a manufacturing facility, whatever. Um, this area in front may have been used for storage. Uh, we could have had things like leaking car batteries or gas tanks or oil, diesel fuel, whatever, leaking there. Um, a typical look at what a brownfield site may, how it may appear, but there's no obvious contamination um, and the soil needs to be tested and the area need to be checked against lists of known brownfield sites. Um, another potential issue causing an area to be a brownfield is leaking underground storage tanks. And these unfortunately are sometimes not discovered until work is being done on the site. And they're um, discovered when tilling or adding amendments or doing other sorts of digging activities. Um, leaking underground storage tanks are generally called lusts um, in industry parlance. Um, and they're very common. Uh, particularly in areas that used to be a gas station or used to be an industrial place where they had lots of trucks coming in and out, so they may have had their own buried um, diesel fuel tanks, that sort of thing. So what do we do if an area is a brownfield? Well, brownfields can be remediated, they, the contaminants removed. Um, the EPA and most states have departments that are dedicated to brownfield remediation. Brownfields can be remediated and used as sites for urban agriculture 
In addition, grants are available to help with the cost of remediation. If you want to turn some formerly uh, lightly contaminated land into something productive, there's usually money available to help you do that. You have to choose the remediation technique, and there are a lot of techniques available for soil and water remediation. Um, and what technique you use depends on things like how much money is available, how much time is available before you have to start using this land, um, how much remediation is required, how polluted or contaminated is it, the amount and the location of the contaminated soil or water, and of course, personal preference. We'll look at some remediation techniques um, that may be a little newer to the industry. One method is simply dig. Dig down and remove all of the contaminated soil down to a point where you find no more contamination. Of course, that leaves you with no soil and you have to have soil trucked in and the site refilled. Um, and then the soil that's been removed has to be remediated somewhere else or buried um, or disposed of in a toxic waste site. We'll look at some other methods here. First is a method called phytoremediation. In phytoremediation, plants are used to remove contaminants. Some plant species are known as hyperaccumulators. That is, they will accumulate large amount of toxins and pollutants in their tissues from the soil. Their roots will take up these pollutants and toxins and they will accumulate in the tissues of the plants. Um, this is an effective remediation technique uh, for heavy metals. The plants are then removed by cutting, mowing, and raking up or otherwise harvesting the plants. And then that process of growing and removing plants is repeated until the contaminants are reduced to the required levels. Um, as a result, this isn't necessarily the fastest way to take care of a brownfield. Um, however, it can be highly effective. Um, the plants that are removed can then be treated themselves at a remediation site or again buried in a toxic waste dump. Another method is called bioremediation and it uses micro microorganisms, primarily bacteria, to remove pollutants. And this type of remediation, like phytoremediation, is often done in situ or meaning with the contaminated soil right where it is, as opposed to removing the soil and taking it to a processing facility or a disposal facility. Unlike phytoremediation, in which the contaminants are removed from the soil and accumulate in the plants, bioremediation organisms actually break down the contaminants themselves into something that's less toxic or non-toxic. So they're properly done. Bioremediation can break down many contaminants. It's good for organic hydrocarbons like fuels, oil, diesel, gasoline, that sort of thing, um, tar, um, and other types of chemical organic sort of pollutants. Um, they're broken down into component parts, which are of themselves much less toxic or even non-toxic. Um, the site to be remediated is inoculated with the appropriate microorganisms. Different types of microorganisms break down different types of contaminants. And then once this process has completed, and it can be faster than phytoremediation, um, because nothing needs to be removed and the microorganisms multiply and, and grow um, on their own, uh, and the soil doesn't have to be taken out, that sort of thing. It's a good process for certain types of contaminations. So the inoculation is usually done by mixing the microorganisms 
with a carrier that can be a water, it could be granulars or powder or something like that, and then that's spread over the entire area. And then it's usually washed down into the soil with water. Another technique, pardon me, another technique is mycoremediation. Mycoremediation uses fungi to break down contaminants, similar to the way bioremediation uses other microorganisms like bacteria. Fungi can grow very, very rapidly, and their mycelia can penetrate virtually any size pore in the soil. So they're capable of rapid remediation, again, of certain types of um, contaminants. Not necessarily suitable for everything, but certain types of contaminants can be done this way. And finally, there are genetic engineering approaches um, where microorganisms, primarily bacteria, but um, work is also being done on fungi, um, are specifically designed to break down certain contaminants. They have genes spliced in that cause them to um, create certain proteins, which then break apart or break down, decompose the toxic materials into non-toxic materials. It may be necessary to do different waves of this to break down materials into something less toxic and then apply a different genetically engineered microbe to break down those things into something non-toxic, or it may be done in one shot. Um, this is a uh, sort of an up and coming field and it's relatively new. Um, however, bioremediation and microremediation have been around for a while um, and are well tested. Um, so that concludes uh, the presentation for this unit.